and now we're ready to get started. Chapter 10, entitled, This is the Way, Walk Ye in It. I have to fix this too. And I think we're getting ready. Okay, I will here try to record. <clears throat> this is Harry Orchard speaking. I will here try to record some of my convictions on the simplicity of the Christian life and the way opened for men to obtain forgiveness, peace, victory, and fellowship with God. I do not believe that any Christian worker, no matter how sincere, can lay down a rigid rule to apply to every penitent who kneels at the altar and seeks forgiveness. God's Spirit will make plain to the individual soul what he must do to find eternal life. Twice I knelt thus, and in each instance the way was made as plain to me as a hand before my face. Human friends helped, but it was God who gave the clear conviction. I consented the first time, to obey as soon as I was able to do so, and instantly had a little glimpse of the true light. But I did not keep my vow. The, then things began to get darker and darker in my plunge into sin, until I stood on the very brink of ruin and was face to face with hopeless death. In my terrible plight, after my arrest and awakening, I again cried out to God for mercy, and once more it was made very plain to me what I must do. The devil was there, also in full force, and came close to persuading me that it was too late. But God's Holy Spirit kept the vision of hope before my eyes until at last I laid hold of it by faith and said, Lord, I will undertake this humiliating task and make all the earthly restitution in my power. I well remember the time I came fully to this decision and resolution, but I said, Lord, I can never do this if you don't help me. And from that time forward, I began to take courage and to feel that God would help me, which he did. I began to pray real prayers and to ask God to help me and to give me grace to go through the awful ordeal that faced me. I read my little Bible a great deal and found the fact recorded there that some of the most beautiful characters portrayed in its pages had been guilty of murder, men such as the prophet Moses, King David, and the dear old Apostle Paul. Still God had forgiven them and afterward used them to accomplish mighty things for him. As I opened my dark heart to God, little by little he let his glorious sunlight in although many times after this I felt downhearted and discouraged, I never turned back, and day by day I gained increasing strength. During this early period, I had kept to myself all that was going on within. The only persons I saw at first were the prison officials and four or five of the inmates who slept in a room adjoining mine. These were trustees who worked in the guard's kitchen and dining room. One of these men, Al Duffner, had been a professional prize fighter and gambler. I noticed that he had a large Bible and that he read it a great deal and seemed to get help and joy from it. One day, when I got a chance to talk to him alone, I brought up the question of salvation and found him more than willing to talk to me. 
Afterward, I asked and obtained permission for him to come into my room so we could talk quietly by ourselves. He told me much of his past life after he had been convicted and sentenced by the court and was at the depot about to take the train that would carry him to the penitentiary to serve 20 years, a man whom he had known came and talked to him about his soul. This man placed a Bible in Duffner's hands and asked him to read it and turn to God. Duffner told me that he knew that this man was a true Christian and stated that he was a Seventh-day Adventist. Then he proceeded to tell me about these people. He stated that there were quite a number of them up in Long Valley, Idaho, where he had run a gambling house in a little mining camp. He repeated the thought that these people were surely Christians. I had only heard of the Adventists and knew little or nothing of the, their teachings at the time. Duffner even told me about the Seventh-day Sabbath, which they observed. He had studied it both from his Bible and the literature they had sent him. We both profited spiritually by this talk. I had firmly made up my mind that I was going through to the kingdom at any cost. Although I never mentioned any of my past life or my present intentions to Duffner, almost all of our conversations were on the Bible. <clears throat> I became interested in the Sabbath question and the Seventh-day Adventists who observed it, for I had firmly made up my mind that I was going to follow God's holy law very closely. Then I went to the penitentiary's Protestant services one Sunday and heard a visiting minister preach. His sermon impressed me greatly, so I asked the warden if I might have a talk with him, to which he readily consented. Soon afterward, this clergyman came to visit me. He was Edwin S. Hinks. Dean of the Protestant Episcopal Cathedral of Boise. I felt from the very first that he was a sincere, earnest man who was well acquainted with his Bible. I was not long in asking him what he thought of the chances of a repentant murderer's obtaining salvation. He replied with emphasis that there was not a word between the covers of the Bible that even hinted that God would not forgive a murderer. He quoted some passages of scripture to sustain his statements. The next question I asked was about the Sabbath, and I well remember his answer. He said, this opens up a great big question. I asked him, if he thought the seventh day was the Bible Sabbath, to which he replied that undoubtedly it was, according to the records. Then I asked why it was that Christians generally did not keep the seventh day instead of Sunday. He explained in a brief way it, but I insisted on knowing why, how, when, and by whom the day had been changed. He did not seek to turn me away from these pointed questions, but tried, as best he could, to explain them to my understanding. He brought me two large volumes of ecclesiastical history, which I read very carefully. There I found that the day had apparently been changed by human authority in the fourth century, then I wanted to know what had become of the apostolic church which Paul, Peter, and others had established. I reasoned that the apostles could scarcely have changed the Sabbath as the Jews were continually on their trail seeking to find some evidence against them whereby they might be put to death and to destroy their work. 
but the Jews made no such accusation against them. After very careful thought and study, I became convinced that the fourth commandment had never been abrogated, but was still binding as much as any other precept of the Decalogue. My mind was fully made up that there would be no halfway work with me this time. Dean Hinks visited me often and was allowed to come to my room and stay as long as he wanted. Almost all of our conversations were on the Bible. I asked him about the Adventists and their teachings, and he spoke very highly of them. He said that they were a people who studied the Bible closely and sincerely lived up to his teachings as they believed them. I look back with deep pleasure and a great sense of great profit to those visits with this good man who did not make the slightest effort to lead me into the particular church which he represented. But he did make a most earnest effort to guide me into the fold of which Jesus Christ is the gatekeeper. He used to tell me that this was the first and all-important question to settle. Church doctrines or differences were secondary. He also brought another friend, a physician, and friend of the unfortunate, Dr. John E. Froome, likewise of Boise, who became a warm friend of mine and a helpful counselor through the years, and he was a Seventh-day Adventist. The belief is firmly grounded in me that the soul that is truly and earnestly seeking light and truth as it is in Christ Jesus and is willing to make a full and complete surrender and to follow him wheresoever he leads will not go astray. This was the stand I took from the beginning. My mother was a Quaker and in my boyhood days I attended the Quaker church and Sunday school. I believe that a larger percentage of the members of that little wooden church were sincere Christians. More than any other church I had known in my younger days. After my death sentence had been commuted to life imprisonment, and I was soundly converted, I felt that I would like to affiliate with some church organization. My study of the Sabbath question, first with Duffner and then with Dean Hinks and Dr. Froome, and especially another incident, which I will now relate, led me to desire to unite with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let me here go back to the day I was sentenced to be hanged. Julian Stunenberg, son of the former governor whom I had murdered, asked Warden Whitney if he might see me a minute. This happened after I had come out of the courthouse and was in a private room of the sheriff's office in Caldwell, waiting for the train to take me back to Boise and the penitentiary. The warden came in and told me of the request and also said that young Stunenberg had a package in his pocket that looked like a gun. He suggested that perhaps I better not see him. After a moment's thought, I told the warden that I felt I should see him, and that if he wanted to kill me, I guessed that from a human standpoint, he had a right to do so. The warden said no more, but went out and brought the young man in. He came up to me and put out his hand, which I took reluctantly. As I felt that I was too much of a moral leper to shake hands with him, his gun proved to be a roll of papers and tracts which he said his mother, wife of the man I had assassinated, had sent to me 
with the request that I read them and turn to God for forgiveness and the salvation of my soul. I would have been somewhat prepared for harsh words from him, but the kind words he spoke broke me all up and felt like coals of fire heaped upon my head. Then I came to find out that Mrs. Stunenberg and the children were all Seventh-day Adventists. Her forgiving attitude toward me convinced me that she surely must be a true Christian. The tracts dealt with some of the very questions I had taken up with Dean Hinks. In fact, when he came out again, I showed them to him and told him how I had gotten them. He seemed much interested. I asked if these Adventists were religious radicals. His answer was quick and to the point. No, not at all. They are fine Christian people and real Bible students. His clear-cut, direct answer had much to do in molding my religious future. This experience with Mrs. Stunenberg was really the supreme factor in leading me to accept Christ fully and then to join the Adventist faith. So it was really this godly woman's influence which was the final barrier in halting my mad rush down the path that leads to destruction. I have no words to express my gratitude toward her, which comes from a heart born again of the Spirit. The attorney had made application to the Board of Pardons to have the recommendation of Judge Wood carried out. This would commute my sentence of death to life imprisonment. This was done without consultation with me. My whole being rose up in rebellion at the thought of spending the remainder of my life behind these dreary gray walls. I wrote to the governor that if that was all the clemency the state could extend, I hoped he would not commute my sentence. I refused to sign the application for a pardon, which was exactly the way I felt at the time. Then the wife of my youth and little Olive pleaded with me in their letters to live if I could, if not for my own sake, then for theirs, and that perhaps some day God would open up a way whereby we might be reunited here below. Other Christian friends who had stood by me when I was so much in need of friends also urged me not to press the matter, saying that it was my duty as one who had accepted Christ to live if I could. I yielded and accepted the clemency of the Board of Pardons. One old soldier of the cross told me that the course I had contemplated would leave me guilty of taking my own life. Indeed, this very question was the one thing that was not at all clear to me at the time. But, bless God, all the clouds at last rolled away and all became clear to me as the noonday sun. I now see that I had wanted my Lord and Savior to wash away my sins and then take me home to glory on a flowery bed of ease. I did not want to bear the cross and endure the shame and, like my Savior, be despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But I was just being prepared to live instead of to die. As I look back upon the days of darkness between my arrest and my conversion, I can now plainly see that my early relationship with God was more one of fear of punishment for my sins than one of real love for my blessed Savior who shed his blood on Calvary to wash away my fearful sins. When I was really converted and changed, I would, of course, have liked to have been set at liberty and thus reunite again with my wife and daughter. I believe that I would have made a good citizen. 
husband and father, but I do not believe that without the prison discipline I would ever have learned to love my Lord and Savior as I now do. I am so glad in my heart that my life was spared to serve him and also that I was not set at liberty at that time. The deprivations I have suffered during the years behind these forbidding walls I count as nothing compared to the priceless lessons I have learned at Jesus' feet. Most of these lessons I have been taught in my little cell and in the little cottage back of the penitentiary where for years I cared for thousands of chickens for the institution. There on my knees before him who told me to watch and pray that I enter not into temptation and to ask anything in his name and the Father would do it. I have learned to know God then too. I always think of Christ's life of prayer and how it was through this medium that he gained the victory. He burst the bands of death and set me free, and he has promised me victory in his name. I have often gone down unto, under temporary defeat and am never satisfied with the measure of victory gained, and all the victories I have ever obtained were won on my knees in prayer. The year after my sentence was commuted, I worked in the commissary department at the penitentiary. I often used to get behind a pile of goods and cry out to God on my knees, asking for grace and strength to overcome the persistent weakness of the flesh. Some of my companions came in upon me and heard my voice and reported that I was losing my mind. They said that it is always a sure sign when one begins talking to himself. Ah, oh, they thought I was talking to myself, but they were sadly mistaken, for I was neither talking to myself nor losing my mind. I was just finding my right mind. I was talking to him who said, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. I had practically no one to talk to who knew God, or who wished to talk about the things of God, when the burden seemed more than I could bear. Then it was that I learned to seek him in the secret place, and there, alone with God, to pour out my troubled heart to him. Always I found him when I knelt and cried out to him in the real spirit of prayer. On the other hand, I have also learned that one may go through the form of prayer and spend long periods on one's knees and still not find Jesus or receive any answer to his prayer. It is easy to drift into a mere form, and yet think that one is really calling upon God in prayer as Jesus taught him to do. But just let some heavy sorrow fall when the burden is so great that one can hardly bear it, and then let him cast his burden on the Lord and ask him to go a mile, and the Lord will go with him twain. I have learned that I must shake off all hollow forms and ceremonies when I call upon God. I so often think of the prayer of the poor publican, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, as I pass from one degree of Christian growth to another and become more reconciled and accustomed to my life here, I find that I have sometimes turned my mind largely to work and worldly pursuits, it is easy to slip away from God, just a little at a time, and not notice yourself slipping until you find yourself drifting into a mere form of Christian life. 
That's the end of that chapter. And now we have a historical chapter written by Leroy Froome. And uh, he starts with this. Orchard's letters to Mrs. Stunenberg breathe deep sorrow and contrition over the terrible wrong done to the family and state that since he has been converted, he wants to be a true Christian and to become an instrument in winning others to Christ. He expresses deep gratitude for the books she sent him, Great Controversy, Patriarchs and Prophets, Ministry of Healing, Heralds of the Morning, Christ's Object Lessons, Desire of Ages, Early Writings, Power for Witnessing, and others, and declares himself unworthy of all these kindnesses. Orchard first asked her not to come see him, stating, I am so unworthy, and I am overcome with grief when I think of meeting you face to face. It was Mrs. Stunenberg's marvelous forgiveness that greatly moved him to look into the faith she possessed. He saw her on four occasions, and on October 24, 1913, he wrote, I do not feel that awful condemnation that I used to feel in your presence. As I search my heart, I feel that I've made all earthly restitution within my power. However, he declared, I cannot get over the feelings of sadness and remorse when I think of you and your family. While I have not a doubt in the world that you have freely forgiven me all the sorrow I have caused you, I wish I could in some way make it right. But that I know is impossible, and it always reminds me of our inability to do anything for our own redemption. Only the priceless blood of Christ can cleanse from all sin. In 1932, in order to watch over the thousands of chickens and turkeys he raised each year for the penitentiary, Orchard was permitted to put up a tiny cabin back of the penitentiary. It was very plain, with two small rooms, in one of which was a hot water heater and a homemade shower. He even made his own chairs. Here, with his beloved Bible and his other books, he was able to keep his early morning vigil with God. This is the secret of his Christian life. It was a humble cottage, but one hallowed with prayer. Regrettably, it burned to the ground July 2, 1950, and everything in the cabin was consumed. Clothes, watch, books, photographs, and remaining letters. But, most fortunately, about two years prior to the fire, Orchard sent me the important documents upon which this story is based. The four manuscripts from which these chapters are collated, his various diaries, a packet of important letters with the request that these be collated and edited for publication. This request was first made in 1929, but penitentiary officials then felt it would be better to wait. Harry Orchard is now, 1952, 86 years of age. Next chapter. When the Haywood and Pettibone trials were over, I would gladly have ended my life rather than to spend it behind prison walls. I felt desperate over it, but in my selfishness I was thinking only of self and not of God, and all his goodness in sparing my unprofitable life and leading me to repentance. In his mercy, he overruled my selfish desires one at a time, as it were, and led me step by step to look away from self. 
He taught me to lean not upon an arm of flesh and blood, but upon him who had purchased me with his own cleansing blood and who alone could and would give me strength to overcome in the daily battle of sin. When I try to fathom the depths of his love, I am lost in wonder. But I do thank him for his patience with me <clears throat> after my sentence had been commuted from death to life imprisonment, I had a second terrible battle on my hands, for my whole being revolted against the future. While I endeavored to become reconciled to the prospect of life imprisonment after it had become a grim, relentless fact, I faced the fiercest struggle that I had yet encountered I asked the warden if he would let me go outside to care for the penitentiary's hogs and chickens. He said that, insofar as he was concerned, he would trust me anywhere, and he soon put me out to care for the chickens and hogs. <clears throat> I started at once to lay the foundation for as fine an industry in these fields as could be built up. The penitentiary already had quite a few hogs and chickens, but they were not of the best quality and were poorly cared for. They were, of course, tended by the inmates. It is almost impossible under the usual prison system to get competent men to carry on such industries. The first consideration the men, uh, the warden must give, is trustworthiness. The first consideration the warden must give is to trustworthiness. In order to obtain this, he often has to accept men without technical efficiency. I had had some experience in caring for hogs and started in at this new work with a will. I built chicken houses and yards and picked out 100 of the best birds to start with and placed them by themselves. I t intended to build up from these, enlarging the industry as I was able to handle it in a profitable and efficient manner. In order to become intelligent in this field, I read the best authorities and was continually planning how to build up the finest hog and chicken industry in the state. Not only something the warden would be proud of, but something which would be profitable to the institution. I also thought that a fine dairy could be built up and knew that all this, all that was lacking, was someone with ability to give his best in making it a success. No one ever went at any task with a greater determination to succeed than I did at this time, but all my plans and hopes were suddenly doomed to collapse. I had been at this about a month and was becoming much interested in my task when the setback came. The warden was severely criticized for trusting me outside the prison walls, but he told me that he would take it all because he believed that I would make good. I can honestly say that his confidence was not misplaced, for nothing then or since would induce me to betray any trust that might be placed in me. When I turned about face, I am free to say, I quit the whole sin business. With my whole soul, I went over to God's side. I was all over the surrounding hills alone during the month I was outside the walls, and never once did the thought occur to me to try to escape, nor has it since. The officials, of course, did not know it, but I was as safe as far as attempting to escape was concerned the first time they permitted me outside as I am today. I had gone through the terrible ordeal of my public confession, and I had no thought of again turning to the beggarly elements of this world. 
I felt a little of what such limited liberty was. But more than that, I was getting a little foretaste of the blessed light and liberty of the truth as it is in Jesus. I knew that even had I wished to, I could not hide from him. On the other hand, I longed to love and to serve him better. My whole thought was to put him first in all that I did and said. I thank him for it all because I have learned how beautiful life really is when we put Jesus first in all our thoughts. How true it is that he makes the yoke easy and the burden light. Warden Whitney and the rest of his officers did all they could properly did all they could probably do to make life as bearable as possible for me under the circumstances. But the criticism against the warden for trusting me reached the ears of some of the members of the Board of Control, and they called him in to inquire about it. The warden had to put me inside again. I, of course, made no objection. Indeed, I couldn't. But I have often thought, had I been given the privilege during those years, I could have built up a fine dairy, hog, and chicken industry. I would have taken the same interest in them as though they had been my own. I do not mean to imply that there were not other men in the prison who might have done the same, but short-time men are the ones usually picked as trustees and they are figuring more on working their way out to freedom by good conduct than in building up some industry for the state. These things cannot be done successfully when men are continually being changed. Still, another drawback was the periodic change of wardens with nearly every new state administration. One warden often differed from his predecessor in his management of the institution, and radical changes in rules and policies were sometimes made in the new regime. At this time, I was placed in the commissary department, cutting meat and handling the supplies. This was new work for me, but I soon learned it and took an interest in it as I had fully made up my mind to do everything I was set to do as well as I could. I started with that goal when I began life anew and have never deviated from it since. I have found it to be the grandest system that I ever have followed. Notwithstanding this, I was soon destined for still another disappointment. The state administration changed again, and with it, the warden. About two weeks after the new warden took charge, he came into the commissary and told me that he was going to change me to another department and that I might take my choice between the shoe shop and the tailor shop. I was not overly surprised at this. I knew that some of the guards, as well as the inmates, were seeking to have me removed because I did not pass out supplies to the men without authorization. When the warden told me, I made no protest or comment of any kind, but simply said that I had done the best I knew how and would continue to do so wherever he put me. As I look back over these disappointments from time to time, I can plainly see the hand of God in it all. If I had turned my attention to the industries of which I have spoken, I might have become so engrossed in them that they might have had a tendency to draw my mind away from God. If I had been permitted to remain in the commissary, I would never have had the opportunity of working for myself on the side and making articles for sale that I will tell you about in their turn. At the time, however, I felt bad over being removed as I knew that it was through 
no fault of my own. I started to work in the shoe shop to which I was assigned with the same interest that I had shown in the other places. However, in the shoe shop, I was thrown into direct contact with all the inmates. Up to this time, I had held aloof from the majority of them. I had slept in a room where there were but two to four of us. I had my meals in the commissary with the man who worked in there keeping the books. I rarely went out into the yard for any length of time. When I went up to my room, I usually got out my Bible or some religious papers and said little to my companions. They soon got so they left me alone and went out into an adjoining room where they played games and talked until bedtime. Today, if I needed additional proof that God has changed my life, I could look back to these first few months of my religious experience and find it in abundance. Before God came into my life, that is, before I was born again of the Spirit and made a new creature in Christ Jesus, I could sit for hours and listen to vulgar, immoral stories, play almost any kind of game, and could scarcely talk without using a string of curses. I had always found a sort of attraction in those vile things. <clears throat> With the new birth, all those old things passed out of my life. They not only have no attraction for me now, but I detest the sound or sight of them. Old things passed away indeed, and behold, all things became new when I became a new creature in Christ Jesus. I soon began to hate the former things, and the longer I live, the more I hate them. As I look back over the years, I can plainly see how tenderly and lovingly the Lord was leading me. I can see that it was best for me that these changes were made. I could now have tools to work with in the shoe shop, and as we then made and repaired only what shoes were used in the institution, we had much spare time to ourselves. This gave time for making other things. I had been in the shoe shop only a few months when I had learned the work and was placed in charge of the shop over several men, a position which I held for years. When I went into the shoe shop, I was placed under the same condition as all other inmates. I was housed in a cell house <clears throat> and ate in the main dining room with the big mess. I am glad that I was so placed, although when I saw this coming, I hoped to avoid it because at the time I wanted to be alone. But I can now see that such was not good for me nor was it good for my fellow inmates, as it fostered a feeling of jealousy. I can plainly see that these things, which brought disappointment at the time, were all for my good. The scripture, all things work together for good to them that love God, has been true in my case. As I look back over God's kind and patient dealings with my early, often rebellious attitude in these matters. When I asked God why it all had to be, I could not at the time see why he asked me to follow the thorny path. By using diplomacy, I might have trodden a smoother one. Even yet, I have to pray to God continually for grace to help me not to make use of this compromising instrument, policy. I still find myself employing it at times, and I try to reason that it is right to use it sometimes in certain things. I do not doubt that it may be right to use a certain amount of policy under some circumstances, but men are so apt to use it 
for selfish purposes, and I have to pray that God will help me to be careful about that. I fear myself more than anything else in the world, but I'm learning that where Jesus leads, I may safely follow, for he sees the end from the beginning. While I may have to pass through fiery trials, still there is peace in my soul through it all. I have proved this principle to my own satisfaction. Since I have asked God to guide my footsteps each day, doing this morning, noon, and night, and many, many times through the day, I have found that the path that looked rough and thorny at the entrance was smoothed as he went before me. When I reached what I thought was my last snubbing post in the shoe shop, I found it to be instead the best place that I could have inside these walls. First of all, most of the old hatred and jealousy from my fellow inmates passed away, and I hope that I have been able to wield an influence for good over some of them. I feel that I have come far short of doing what I should have done for God. In looking back, I also see how God has prospered me in temporal things. After I'd been in the shoe shop a little while, I asked Warden Whitney if he would lend me $20 to get some material with which to make such articles as we are allowed to make and place on sale. I hoped to earn a few dollars to help my wife and little Olive. The good man sent me a check for the amount, and I sent for some leather. Then, with the help of one of the boys skilled in that line, I made a bridle. I sent this to a friend in Colorado who sold it for me and sent me back thirty-four do- uh, between 30 and $40. I repaid Mr. Whitney, and I have never been permanently without money. <clears throat> some may think, that a man behind prison walls has no chance to squander his money, but he has, if he is so inclined. I have known many men who here work all their spare time making articles for sale, yet they are broke a good part of the time. It is strictly against the rules to gamble here, and the men are punished if caught. Yet many take the chance. Thank God that old gambling spirit has been banished from my mind. I would not bet a nickel against a million dollars, even if I knew I was certain to win. (laughs) Some may doubt such a broad statement, but God knows I speak the truth. I know that God's Holy Spirit would immediately condemn me, and I would have to give the money back before he would forgive me. These principles are very real to me. No, there is nothing in this world or in 10,000 worlds like it that I would exchange for this free and full salvation which I have through Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have often had men come and bid me goodbye as they were leaving the prison and tell me that they wished I too were going. I know that many of them felt a real sympathy for me here. I invariably told them that I would be glad to leave the prison with them, but I also told them that our ways would part immediately as soon as we were outside the walls. I knew that they were not converted and would soon go after the sinful things of the world again. Therefore, I would not think of changing places with them, even if it were possible. I have seen many men go out from here in the same frame of mind in which they came, only to be brought back within a few months, repeating sometimes two, three, and even four times over. Most of the men here are young, and many of them are more than have more than ordinary intelligence. I often think, as I look upon them, that if they could only be brought into harmony with God, how useful their lives might become. 
I know that true Christianity is all that is necessary to make the lowest criminal one of the very best citizens. It changed Jerry McCauley, the river thief of New York, into a great missionary. It did the same thing for Valentine Burke of St. Louis and Dick Lane of Chicago and many others whom the stone walls and iron bars failed to change. <clears throat> it has long been a pleasure for me to work. It is true that I like to work a part of the time for myself, but I always do the state's work first. However, it matters not whether I am working for myself or for the state. I always try to excel. In this, God has been good to me also, for he has prospered me beyond my expectations. For a number of years, my specialty was making fancy hairbrushes and clothes brushes. I bought the very finest bristles and learned to make a brush that compares favorably with the best brush made. I have never heard of any purchasers who were not well satisfied. They do not, oh, excuse me, they do cost considerably more than the ordinary brush, but in this way I've been able to make many hundreds of dollars, most of which I have sent to my wife and daughter. When I began to have this steady income, I started to take out one-tenth as a tithe for the Lord's work. The warden at the time objected to this, giving as his reason that I ought to send it all to my wife and daughter. I felt then, and still feel, that I would have, ju that I would have just as much money to send them after giving the Lord his part. I feel to say with the psalmist in Psalm 37, I've been young and now am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I have ever felt that tithe paying is a duty I owe to God. There are many Bible passages that support this sound Bible system of finance. I commend it all. I commend it to all. And that's where we'll stop this evening. It's getting close to closing time, and so we shall close with prayer. Father, we come to you thankful for this uh, reading we had tonight, at least from my point of view. It reinforced in my mind the importance to do excellently everything our hands find to do. So please help us, Father, to bring honor and glory to you by doing so with the time that we have, with the work that we do, with the relationships we have, may all be done to your honor and glory. And please bless each one tonight who's been with us. May they have a safe and healthy week ahead of them and be with Pastor and Sherry as they're on the road, we ask. And any burdens or concerns that each one of us may have on our hearts, Father, we ask that you intervene and, and perform your goodwill in those lives or in those concerns and also in our own lives, we pray in Jesus' name. And thank you. Amen. Amen.